47.2% of adults in the United States age 30 and older have some form of periodontal disease, according to the CDC. But gum disease doesn't just put oral health at risk. It also could put patients at greater risk for other conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and some studies are now suggesting COVID-19. While periodontal flap surgery often has been used to remedy periodontal disease, laser treatment is gaining ground as an alternative and, one recent study says, why the BioLaser Repair Perio Laser Protocol may provide superior outcomes. Dr. Samuel Lau, Chief Clinical Officer at BioLaser, is with us today to provide us with insight about the benefits of laser procedures, the recent study, and what it could mean for periodontal treatment in the future. Dr. Lau, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Richard. Always a pleasure to be with you. And you too. Now, to begin with, a little bit of background. Could you briefly sum up periodontal flap surgery, when it's indicated, what it involves, and what the results typically are? Well, uh, if I go back a few decades, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, the primary way to manage uh, periodontitis, and that is bone loss disease, not gingivitis, uh, was to do a gingivectomy and literally just cut the gums off to reduce the pockets. In the 50s and 60s, a procedure called the apically repositioned flap uh, began to come on the horizon. And with that uh, came something that we call also osseous or bone resective surgery. All of that was to basically reduce pocket depths and thus providing access for not only the patient, but also for the clinician. In the 70s, there began to be, and I'm doing this sort of chronologically, in the 70s, um, these procedures, what we call flap and osseous procedures, uh, began to be questioned, especially by our Scandinavian brothers and sisters. And looking at really what were we trying to achieve? Was it just pocket depth reduction? Was it also attachment level gain? So not to get overly technical, but like every other discipline in healthcare, uh, we have moved through phases. Mm -hmm. And so for probably the last three, four decades, this thing called flap and osseous periodontal surgery uh, ha has actually been what one considers as the first go-to. However, starting in the 70s, as I mentioned, there's always been people knocking on the door asking could there be a better way. Uh, flap and osseous surgery in most practices, whether it be periodontists or general practitioners, uh, is done uh, definitely with the patients in mind, uh, with reducing pockets and thus creating an environment to save teeth. Uh, however, if you do look at the procedure itself, mm -hmm. it's definitely not minimally invasive. Okay. And our patients and the referrals that we get from dentists and hygienists have started to become, well, how come you, well, if medicine is going towards minimally invasive, if even restorative dentistry is going towards minimally invasive, how come managing those 47% of those periodontitis? Alert from calendar. RDH selection process and DNA medicine. of a successful trial so event. From that standpoint, um, there have been more minimally invasive procedures. So I, I want to suggest the caveat, flap and osseous surgery works. Mm -hmm. Most patients get up the next day and are fine, but the perception of it, Richard, mm -hmm. you and I would need to have a really good PR firm <laughs> because folks just don't want it. So what does that mean? In a recent conversation I had with Gordon Christensen, he said, Sam, you periodontists have got to find ways that patients are going to accept care and not just go back home or not go see the periodontist. And that's what this is all about. Okay, and so as an alternative then, laser surgery is starting to emerge, which is much, much less invasive, certainly minimally inv invasive compared to the um, periodontal flap surgery. So what is the BioLaser Repair Perio Laser Protocol specifically then, and how does it differ from other laser approaches? Well, it's not as conservative mm -hmm. as what we have seen in the past with laser procedures. Okay. In other words, 
many of the laser procedures are incredibly conservative and borderline on something that we call curatage. Okay. That is not acceptable to periodontists and also general practitioners, by the way, and I do want to include them mm -hmm. because there's many general practitioners out there that perform periodontal surgical procedures every day. Okay. Because as you and I both know, and it's not up to me, patients want to be treated in one place. They love their dentist. They don't want to go where, this is not 30 years ago. So what that means then is if we talk specifically about repair perio, which was the procedure that was performed in the study that, that you suggested, mm -hmm. that's published now, that this is a common, <coughs> excuse me, a combination of not necessarily a major flap, but enough of a, a, a laser generated slight flap procedure to be able to see the roots and see the bone. And what's critical about this is, is that we need to see what's on the roots, mm -hmm. whether it be through a scope or through our eyes or through our loops, we cannot leave debris on roots, especially calculus that will attract more biofilm. So when we set out to create this protocol, I said, wait a minute, let's not try to find the magic bullet here. Mm -hmm. Let's use the laser as an adjunctive procedure to what we are already known to be the, the basic acumen of what we do in perio. Okay. So it seems like the laser, this new approach in laser therapy is almost splitting the difference between the manual surgical approach and the pure laser approach. Exactly. Now, Richard, um, I, you know, I've been a big fan of the publication. Science and transparency mm -hmm. is time for that. Okay. So the bottom line is this. Mm-hmm. We can't continue to rely on monotherapies. Mm -hmm. What we are doing is providing tools in a toolbox with an ultimate goal. There are even times where there is severe periodontitis with substantial bony defects that we need to add bone grafting or we need to add biologics and whether they be like amyloblastic proteins or PRP or PRF, which you know is quite popular now. Mm -hmm. But we have forgotten that it's not the device that drives this, it's the clinician that drives this, choosing devices and products to get where we want to be. Okay, and, and taking a look at that study that compared these different procedures, uh, can you tell us about some of the results? Sure. Um, what, what this group did, it's called the McGuire Institute. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the periodontists that are part of this, I, I can't imagine throughout the world, every periodontist does not know these names. So these are very credible clinicians. Mm -hmm. And what this group decided, which is the integrity of this group, is to create something called an RCT, randomized controlled trial, single blinded, and I must suggest to you, very few studies ever do that. Okay. Not just in laser, everything, including COVID-19, sorry. Mm -hmm. However, this is the way you have to do it. And then they did six sites, six different clinicians independently. Mm -hmm. They were using repair perio. They were all calibrated. They're all doing this little compromise, little mini flap kind of thing. Mm -hmm. By the way, to, to also to suggest the flap scenario is conservative enough that you don't need sutures. Hmm. Okay. So, and it comes back, we use like a uh, polymer sometimes to put it back. But for the most part, what they found was very consistent among all six. Mm -hmm. And that is when they compared it to a procedure called minimally invasive surgical technique, which is probably the most predominant uh, surgical technique done in Europe and is here also now, that when they compared it, there was no difference. 
in clinical outcomes, except for some things. One, the procedure was 25% faster, meaning okay. less time for the clinician, seeing more patients, and also less time for our patients. Number two, we called it patient-related outcomes. By the way, no medical clinical study will probably can be published without not just clinical outcomes, but patient-related outcomes. Mm -hmm. In other words, how did you feel the next day? How many analgesics did you take the next day? And when they looked at that, there was substantial reduction in bruising, bleeding, swelling, compared to even a fairly conservative procedure called minimally invasive surgical technique. So you can imagine what that would have been like if it had been the full-blown traditional laponosseous surgery mm -hmm. of the subjects. So basically, um, patients themselves are, are, are feeling better, they're healing quicker, and, and they just, just generally have a more positive outlook upon leaving the dental practice and a, in the days following this, the procedure. Exactly. This study did not just have little surveys of how'd you feel the next day. Mm -hmm. This study had behavioral patient-related outcomes experts who created these survey dynamics mm -hmm. to determine how did you feel? Because the bottom line is this, we're in a different society. Mm -hmm. Patients to a certain degree are somewhat, let's say selfish. Okay. If they have a procedure that they stay in bed, it's memorable. I'm not saying flat analysis is, but you know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell their friends. They're going to tell their neighbors. They're going to tell their family. They're going to go on YouTube. And you know what? They're not going to seek care. They're going to lose your teeth. Why? Because all they're going to do is have cleanings every three months. Mm -hmm. We need surgical procedures for moderate to severe peritonitis. This creates that window for that to happen. So is there an educational component this, uh, a part of this treatment as well to encourage patients that, okay, now that we fix the gum disease for today, how do we prevent it from happening again in the future so you don't come back three months, six months from now for another significant cleaning? Excellent. I so appreciate it because you see, if you use a magic silver bullet mm -hmm. and you push that to such a degree, what would the patient say? Well, I'm fixed. You know, I never, ever encourage anyone to ever say the words fix or treat in a dental practice. Mm -hmm. You should always use manage. We just got, it's like, it's like being a diabetologist. Mm -hmm. We just got you to the state that we can maintain you. Mm -hmm. But the day you walk out that door, the day that you don't do some kind of oral hygiene, <laughs> the day you don't take care of yourself, physically, and you mentioned heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, then it's going to revert. You, there's maybe a little bit of controversy here, but then again, you're interviewing me so I can get away with this. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> you don't cure periodontal disease. You manage periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. Periodontal disease is a chronic inflammatory disease. Mm -hmm. You don't cure rheumatoid arthritis. You don't cure diabetes. Mm -hmm. You manage it. And that's where some of our friends who believe that you can just swish with some magical potion, stuff some magical potion in the sulcus, if your focus is strictly on the microbial flora, mm -hmm. you will not be able to manage periodontitis. Okay. And just generally speaking, especially with um, infection control protocols being so elevated these days, uh, what advantages does laser treatment and, and this procedure in particular offer um, in an age where everybody's concerned about transmission? Well, and these are done uh, in-house, uh, mm -hmm. what is we call data on file, but I have monitored those studies. Mm -hmm. And there is a good 98% reduction in aerosols mm -hmm. when you look at using an erbium chromium YCG laser mm -hmm. versus a high-speed handpiece. Okay. So we do know there is definitely less aerosol. 
Mm -hmm. But we all know, and we have elevated our education, haven't we, in that high, good quality, high evacuation systems at the point of contact, mm -hmm. uh, pre procedural rinses. But for viewers, uh, if you had your choice between a high speed handpiece for these procedures, which are used, and a erbium chromium YCG laser with minimal aerosol then this would be the direction that you would want to take if mm -hmm. you're strictly looking at infection control. And I would throw one other thing in, but this is more Richard, on the non-surgical aspect. You know, probably 98% of all perio is treated by dental hygienists in the practice of uh, a general dentist. Right. So therefore, hygienists have now had this decision, do I continue using ultrasonics? Mm -hmm. And should I de and you know this? I should I decrease ultrasonic and use manual instrumentation? If I do that, will that actually decrease my the quality of my care? And I personally believe, looking at studies, that there is an advantage of ultrasonics over manual instrumentation. Mm -hmm. most, most studies demonstrate that. But now, if you take something called the diode laser, mm -hmm. and now you use it in the hygiene operatory for laser bacterial reduction and for curatage. I add that part because that's the inflammatory part. Mm -hmm. Diode lasers have no aerosol because there's no water going through them. Mm -hmm. And if someone would suggest, what about the plume? You're using such low settings that are non-thermal that you won't even have a plume. So you see many practitioners, uh, general dentists, gravitating to adding a diode laser to the repertoire of the hygienist to somewhat offset the fact that they can't continue to use ultrasonics to the level that they were in the past. Okay, and what is that learning curve like for general dentists and uh, hygienists who are starting to get involved in the laser technology? Um, what is that le learning curve like? Is it easy for them to adapt to or is it a bit more significant? For the diode laser for a dental hygienist or a dentist who chooses to do laser bacterial reduction, Mm -hmm. The learning curve is extremely short. Mm -hmm. However, I'm one that does not believe that learning curve in, uh, it contains an online course on lasers. Okay. I still, you know, I will be an, I am an officer of the Academy of Laser Dentistry. Mm -hmm. And these are still class four medical devices. We forget that part. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be training. However, the learning curve for the perio repair that you and I are discussing, mm -hmm. That is a little bit more, okay. meaning that it's very acceptable, but there you need in-person training uh, that needs to be a good one and a half to two days. And most quality laser companies that sell class four lasers, especially in what we call the erbium or the surgical lasers, mm -hmm. they almost all of them uh, have those kinds of quality training programs. So on Monday, you are competent and skilled. Now, in the, again, spirit of being um, transparent, one of the things that happens, however, is you've got a new tool in your practice, mm -hmm. and it's a machine, <laughs> and unless your team also adopts it, mm -hmm. then, for, because they're the ones that are going to be maintaining it, let's face it, dentists don't work on their stuff. Mm -hmm. The dental assistants work on their stuff. Right. So they have got to be brought into this. And so when we do trainings, I always encourage that the whole team be part of the trainings so that when the doctor is out of the operatory, you know the patient's going to say, well, what is that? What is he going to do? What is she going to do? Mm -hmm. So it, it's team training that we believe gets your best adoption. And where can uh, dental practices go to uh, acquire some of this training, not just in lasers in general, but also for this uh, this new hybrid pr procedure we've been discussing. Well, most training is only done in two areas. Mm -hmm. One is through the Academy of Laser Dentistry. I like that training because it's not corporate related and objective. Mm -hmm. And they have something called standard certification. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to really reach that high level, uh, they have advanced proficiency, et cetera. But most good laser companies have excellent training, including training a dental laser safety officer and what they're supposed to be doing, 
Mm -hmm. But I want to reinforce one thing. You know, when you, when you look at, let's look at the Food and Drug Administration, there's only really two things they look at, mm -hmm. uh, safety and efficacy. In other words, does it hurt somebody or, and does it work? Lasers are for the most part one of the safest devices in a dental laboratory. It's non-ionizing radiation. Uh, the only thing that's critical is eye protection. Mm -hmm. Lenses to block out that respective wavelength. So when we look at training, we're looking at safety and we're also looking at the ability for that participant to be able to be competent in those procedures. So I always say, look, when you purchase something, don't just purchase the laser. You need to ask them about what is the training like? Mm -hmm. uh, how, what's the extent of the training? Uh, do I have to travel somewhere, especially now during COVID-19? Mm -hmm. And to let you know that we just created, I created, virtual hands-on laser training for the diode. Mm. It took work it's with visualizers and because you know AGD now allows for credit, but AGD has one very important caveat. You on the other side of Zoom has to be able to be competent to watch the person on the other side of the Zoom mm -hmm. using the device to where it is at the same as it was face to face. And that's what I created on virtual training. However, that's where the line in the sand goes because for surgical lasers, mm -hmm. if we're ever talking with peripheral, that has to be face to face. And so now what are most companies doing? They're putting trainers on the plane and going to your office and training you within your environment. Okay, and um, also for your the uh, training that you said you've been uh, creating yourself, do you have a website or a place where people can go to, uh, to watch those videos that online work? Uh, well, yes, uh, but, and there's two ways, but if you went to, uh, you know, uh, www.drsamlowlow.com, mm -hmm. at least if you went there, you would see what is there, but for the BioLace, you would literally go on the BioLace site, which would be okay. the www.biolace.com, but, but I feel that we should be open with, what, with, with, with knowledge base, so any of your listeners that want to get in touch with me, it's very si simple. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like sam at drsamlow.com. So S-A-M at D-R-S-A-M-L-O-W.com. And okay. I will find a way with information for you. Perfect. And uh, before we wrap up today, do you have any other comments about this particular study or the future of lasers in general? Um, no, but I do appreciate your, your opening remarks. Um, you know, we have to make sure we do not have cognitive dissonance. In other words, drinking so much Kool-Aid that we begin something works when really, uh, you know, it doesn't. But at the same time, I believe, Richard, mm -hmm. that dentistry is moving towards holistic and it is moving toward minimally invasive lasers are about as natural as it can be it's called light and my vision is in the next five years dental lasers will be the primary staple device in managing chronic inflammatory periodontitis okay good and with that i think we can wrap things up here thank you so much again for your time and your expertise today and we look forward to hearing from you again in the future as new developments come up thank you richard thank you for the opportunity i appreciate Great. it have a great day. Thanks again.